refine me father refine me cleanse me from sin all of my sin Lord, refine me father refine me cleanse me within today i want to pick right up where we left off um, last week, in First Thessalonians chapter two, and we talked about the difference between encouragement and what we're commanded to do, and flattery, which we are commanded not to do. And encouragement is to be part of our lives, but we are to mark those that flatter, and we're not to have that in our own lives, because uh, there's so much in the Bible about flattery. And I've never, I don't think I've ever heard any, any messages on flattery. But as I've been studying, I didn't think I had another message in there, but it was like I, w I wasn't done. God wasn't done telling us because I believe flattery is going to be one of the end time sins. And when you spot flattery coming from a politician, coming from a salesman or a preacher, and are you against preachers? No, I'm for the good ones, but we need to expose the bad ones. And it's hard because Satan comes as an angel of light. So we need to develop discernment and really trust in God and also uh, be aware of some of these things that the enemy uses. And it says he shall obtain the kingdom by flatteries. I've never seen that before. I, it just never registered to me before is how the Antichrist is going to come into power by flattering us. And it's, it's the kings, they use the politicians, they use, this is going to be your best year, this is going to be no taxes, I'm not raising taxes. Have you ever found one of them yet to, to be true as our taxes rise and rise and rise? They flatter you to get in office and then nothing changes. So, you know, we're not to be moved by the world and how it operates and what they say and they do. And that old Indian joke that I had was Hoya, they said Hoya. It's a bunch of Hoya, it's not true. That's another story, but 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, let's look at verse 3. For our exhortation was not of deceit. We are in an age now where people only want positive messages, but they're not preaching truthful messages. With truth, Jesus only spoke truth, and with truth, he always exposed error. He always gave warnings, and he wasn't a flatterer. Jesus exposed the Pharisees. And gossip is when you talk about someone behind their back. But flattery is when you talk to them about your face, at your face, something you'd never say about them behind their back. In other words, you're saying it for an advantage. You're trying to gain something for yourself. Flatterers are evil. God said he's going to get rid of the flattering lips. So we don't want to be a part of, of that. It, flattery also in the Hebrew means smooth, smoothness. But let's read this here. For our, our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanliness, nor in guile, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men. And this is why Jesus was different. He always did that which pleased the Father. He always did the will of the Father. He was dependent. And when we're humble, and when how Jesus showed us, you come under Submission means to sub, go under, like under. So when you're submitting to God, you're underneath him. When you're in pride, you're going above him. And that's the reason why it's such a, a bad sin is this was the original sin found in Lucifer, which became the devil, and pride caused him to be thrown out. And it will cause us to be rejected by God. He says, I resist the proud, but I give grace to the humble. So we need to find out as much as we can on how can I stay humble and keep receiving God's blessings versus resist that pride that's going to cause God to resist us, right? Well, flattery is one of the things that feeds our pride and our ego, and it swells up our head, and then we have this big head, and we're blinded, and we fall into a trap for our feet. So we don't want to be blinded by flattery, the, the wrong, insincere lies, we want to know truth, even though sometimes it keeps your head on straight. <laughs> it's not too flattering to hear truth sometimes, but it keeps your feet from falling. So he said, we're not pleasing men, nor at any time used we flattering words. 
This is important. Preachers are not to be using flattering words to gain a crowd, to gain fans, to, to you know, whatever it is, to gain an audience approval. We are not to flatter people. He said, they never did. Nor a cloak of covetousness, because covetousness can have a cloak on it. Where their flattery is, there's a lot of time greed or selfish ambition, and it's covered. You can't see it. And that's why we need discernment in this hour. Lord, remove the veil. Help me see beyond these cloaks of, of covetousness or whatever the, the motive that isn't correct and isn't from God might be. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet others. And I like that. We, we aren't seeking our glory from men. The Bible says that no flesh will glory in his presence. So what happens when we see flattery, we see uh, politicians, salesmen, or preachers using flattery, it's always really about them. In the kingdom of God, it's all about God and Jesus, right? It's about him. False prophets, they get on the stage, and all of a sudden you end up here, and all they do is talk about themselves. And if you start learning how to detect it, you'll say, these people are really out for themselves. But it's very subtle, because the enemy's not going to come in a, in a, hello, I'm the devil. He's coming as an angel of light. He's coming with deception. And he's coming with his main tool, I believe in these end times, is flattery. And flattery is poison. It's poison if we swallow it because now all of a sudden it's feeding something that Jesus told us to crucify. Crucify that flesh. Don't feed it. But encouragement, true, sincere, godly, praised, you're, you're encouraging somebody it doesn't feed your pride. It strengthens you to go forward through the obstacles, through the trials, through the tests, through all the storms we have in life. We need those people around us that are truly sent to encourage us. We all need it, right? Amen. So the true men and women of God don't flatter, neither do they take bribes. We've already talked about that. In Proverbs 29.5, a man that flattereth his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. So flattery opens you up to deception, and deception opens you up to many other things. So the door that we have to keep shut is a flattering spirit. The flatterer's mouth, what does it work? It works ruin. Their focus is how they can gain by using you. It's sad, but there are many people that are out for themselves. They're narcissistic. We're living in more and more of a narcissistic society, lovers of self, it's all about me, uh, sociopaths, uh, they don't have a conscience, it's all about them, but they're fake people. They can put on a great show and they can act so caring and loving as long as it's to their advantage, but the moment that things aren't about them and you stand up for truth, a true narcissist will attack you because they have a narcissistic wound and all of a sudden now you're correcting them and they're already so, sh they can't handle correction. So what do they do? They attack you and they smear you. So that's part of the time, the end times that we're living. Um, the Hebrew word for flattery is smooth or slippery or caress, pet or stroke or butter up. Can you tell when someone's buttering you up? It's not real. It's, and if you learn to hear it, you can, all, can tell the, insincerity in it. It's fake words. Flattery seeks to take advantage, to manipulate. And this is what you have to see. The real goal when someone's flattering, why are they flattering me? Now we all like to be honored and appreciated and we need to do that. But then there's the, the flattery which it's like, okay, they want something. What do they want? They want to control or play by unfair means to one's own advantage. The smooth tongue of the adulteress, Proverbs 6, 24. Her lips drip honey. They're smoother than oil is her speech. She's out seducing. She wants something. Her husband's away. So she's flattering this guy with her tongue to get something that she wants. Flattery fires, fans the fires of pride and results in the old self resurrecting. And you can almost tell when you feel it's an unnormal, it's an unnatural praise. Um, Jesus come, come and commanded us to 
Crucify this flesh. Beware of feeding the fires of pride. How dangerous this false praise can be as it puffs up our head while spreading a net for our feet. And this is the thing I want you to know, especially for those of us in church. This is the skill of the false teacher. The false teachers use the pulpit to flatter. This is your best life now. How to be famous. How to get your dream. It's all so perverted. It's all about us. And we're sitting there, yeah, yeah, yeah. And pretty soon you don't need God. Why do you need God? Because it's all about you. Where humility is like, I need the Lord. I need, I'm dependent on him. Like the vine and the branch. That vine is my life source. The branch has to have that vine. I am dependent on and it's a good dependency. It's a dependent on him. And then as you get dependent upon him, it's his joy becomes your joy. His love becomes your love. His patience. You can tell when we're not patient anymore. We're not abiding in him. We're off in the flesh doing our own thing. Oops, kind of missed that a little bit. And we got to come back and hook up again because we're running on our own fumes. You know what I'm saying? Which we've all done. So think about the flattery of Judas. He betrayed Jesus with what? A kiss. If someone comes and kisses you and tells you how great you are, and then he's, what is he doing? He's plotting to destroy Jesus behind his back. But don't think Jesus was fooled. He knew. He knew of the betrayal of the kiss. He knew exactly what was happening. So it's smoothness. It's all about, you know, they always say a slick salesman <laughs> or a slick evangelist. It's like they're smooth. It's just almost like, too good to be true. Flattering lips. Satan's most subtle poison, I believe, is going to be flattery. And we have to know what this is. Flattery will be one of the leading sins in the last days. It's the favorite tool of the manipulator and the deceiver because they can't control you unless they can get an opening or an open door into you so how do they get you to let down your guard flatter you and the flesh loves to be praised and pampered and buttered up the flatter the person that flatters as a way of life now we can all give in to flattery but i'm talking about the flatterer basically the character of the flatterer is an actor lying and trapping you he's a hypocrite He's a Pharisee. Many times the Jesus would confront the Pharisees. He is to be marked and avoided. We th we're hearing that we should just love and unite. Can you imagine if there's no correction in these churches, what's going to happen? The Jezebels are tolerated. There's mass confusion. Everybody's flattering each other. Everybody's running around with these fake confessions. There's fake people. There's no real, it's all fake. And there's no two shepherds that are getting rid of the wolves. You're going to have a massive mess. So the true shepherds have to mark, mark the false ones. And the other thing that's really hard is a lot of these false teachers that are, the Bible, is, there's so much about false doctrine and false teachings in the Bible. If you look at it, it's like the number one warning is against in the end times is the false that's coming. And they're nice people. These are flattering, happy. Some of them are smiling and telling you you can have your best life now. I mean, they, they just make up a good show. So you have to know you can't go by the outer appearance. You have to go by what's being said consistently because true preachers have to preach the whole counsel of God. You don't pick out a few scriptures that you like. You have to stand before God and say, I gave him a well-balanced diet. I gave them their beans, I gave them their spinach, I gave them their kale, I gave them all the stuff they didn't want. They tried to spit it out, but I, like a good mom, I just shoved it right back in their mouth because you have to preach the whole counsel of God. You don't just take a few subjects and build them and make them so, that's all you think about when you come to God is how great you're going to have it now because you are saved. God owes you a perfect life. So you have to mark these teachers and avoid them because they're toxic and they're insincere. False teachers, I'm going to say a minute about them. They are flatterers, and they use flattery to lead people astray and to benefit themselves. To attract a crowd, they water down the Bible to a get rich, get healed, get famous. Self-help gospel. 
with life coaches and motivational speak speakers. Preachers aren't called just to motivate you. You don't have to get to go even go to a church to get a, a self-help, motivational, life coach message. It doesn't even take someone to be saved to give you that. You can get those in the world. And a lot of times people go, this, this church is preaching messages like my, my company, my corporation. It's all these motivational messages. This is deception and flattery at work. Tickle, tickle. Fill their pockets. They love promoting themselves and being the center of attention. The more you spot this, the more when this spirit starts to manifest, you won't be able to watch it. I was watching a preacher on YouTube a couple days ago, and the flattery was so strong. Now that I'm watching for us, like, and it, the sub, there was no substance in the message. I'm like, what are you preaching about? It was all about, hi- all you could do is look at this guy, and, you know, it's just like, wow, you know, you're so impressed or unimpressed with the guy, you couldn't hear the message because he wasn't preaching the gospel. I was like, wow, this is really rampant right now. Do you know what I'm saying? They love promoting themselves and being the center of attraction. Remember, no flesh will glory in the presence of... God likes these messages. He shows (laughs) up. No flesh will glory. It's not about us. It's about him. Lifting him up and telling people how, what he says and what he, how we're supposed to live. We're, it's not about us. It's not about us. Jesus spoke the truth, popular or not. He never flattered for personal gain. Well, if I preach this message, people are going to leave and stop tithing. He'd say, you want to go too? Yeah. John 6, 6, 6. He never worried about being taken care of because he did the Father's will. And he said, Lord, you're just going to have to take care of me. Jesus, you're going to have to take care of me. In Daniel 11.21, the man of sin will use flatteries to obtain the kingdom. What does that make it? All about you. It doesn't promote Christ. It promotes you. Beware when it's all about you. The end times, we have narcissistic society. We have narcissistic preachers. We have narcissistic people. We want it to all be about us. Remember, that's pride. And God resists us when we get in pride. I want to say another couple things about false teachers. You say, well, name names. No, you're going to have to learn to recognize them because as soon as you start seeing these red flags, you can pull back. Otherwise, we have become followers of men and followers of movements rather than following Jesus. The method of false teachers is to use smooth and flattering speech to deceive the naive. False teachers are nice. They're likable. They tell you how great you are. But they don't talk about anything negative, like sin and the coming judgment. We need to learn to judge ourselves so we will not be judged. That's a good preacher that tells you, judge yourself, examine yourself, see if you're in the faith. Are you contending for the faith? That makes you look at yourself now while we still can. Because there'll be a time where we won't be able to judge ourselves. We're like, well, no one ever taught me this. They preach on false love. Just unite everyone. Let's all love. They preach on false unity, twisted scriptures. And now it's huge. They only preach the New Testament. Beware when people leave out or take away. There are so many great stories, and we're going to go into some today, uh, in the Old Testament. That God warns us of all this stuff. And we see characters and how they were lifted up and how they got successful and how they failed because they started depending on God when they were small in their own eyes. But as success came, as growth came, as power came, they didn't need God anymore. They stopped depending on God and they got into pride. And what happened? God resisted them. False teachers also appeal to your greed and your pride. You want to get rich quick? Some preachers you just know, boy, they're money. That's all they do is talk about money. But those preachers are there. If you're greedy, you're going to follow after that, and you're going to want that kind of a gospel. That's, I think that's your judgment right there. So we have to make sure that we don't hook up to the wrong things and let someone pump up our greed or pump up our flesh. So we have to be discerning to spot them. 
Proverbs 8.13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance, not just dislike, we have to come to say, Lord, I want to love what you love and I want to hate what you hate. God hates a flattering lip, smooth talkers coming in, just flatter, butter you up, get your head all puffed up, and then all of a sudden now you're set up for a big trap and you fall right into that trap. And he said, the perverse mouth do I hate. What's a perverse mouth? It's against what's right. God says, I hate it, so we have to hate it. So today we are obsessed with speaking positively, but not truthfully. Truth now, today, in the years we live in, has become hate speech. They mark you as a hater because you're saying what God says. You're putting up the boundaries on genders. You're putting on the boundaries on morals. You're putting up, this is what God says. Now all of a sudden, you're causing division. You're the troublemaker. You're the hater. Not in God's eyes, but you have to know this world now, it's not our home. We're just passing through. But the seducers have been work. Satan has been working a long time to seduce the church. Let's turn to Second Chronicles 26. This is one of my favorite little stories on pride. Second Chronicles 26. The dangers of pride and flattery. It's something we need to constantly keep before us and say, Lord, I want to be dependent on you. I want to be humble. I want to stay abiding. I want to know it's always about you. It's not about my dream. It's about your dream. What do you want me to do? When I stand before you, I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You did what I wanted you to do. Right? So here's the story of Uzziah. In verse 3, when he was 16 years old, he began to reign. Think of that. A 16-year-old. Hannah, you could almost be a king. <laughs> 16 years old, he began to reign. In verse 4, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. It's not how we start off. How are you going to finish? Are we going to end well? The other day I was walking by my bed and I, I don't know if it's this lady we're seeing today or not, but I, I said to Tim, someone's going to die. I can feel it. Someone's going off into death. And it was almost like for a second I could feel the darkness. It was just like, wow. At any time, are we really ready to meet the Lord? Are we ready? We have to always be, Lord, I'm, I'm, there's nothing in my life that I know of that would keep me from fellowshipping with you. There's nothing that I've put before you. I want to make sure. I mean, none of us are guaranteed anything. You know, this one lady was praying. She goes, my, I'm trying to keep my mother alive. I'm like, it's not about your faith. It's, she's old. It's time to go home. You got to learn. We got to learn to release people. Heaven is a good place to go to. You know, she said, well, she's got this and that and that. And it's like, well, it's, yeah, we, we, we have, the secret things belong to the Lord. We don't know why things. And we're lying if we think we have all the answers. We're just little creatures depending on God and one day we'll, we'll see things from a different point of view. But now God's given us his light, his word, and we have to grasp everything we can and stay humble on those words. But it's not about our great answers, our quick advice. It's about, Lord, there is a sovereignty here that most of our generation has never been taught. The sovereignty of God. God is still God. And things happen, you know. It's not because of just our bad confession things happen. <laughs> things happen. You can't control the universe by your tongue. We have been taught that it's all about the pressure, the condemnation people have been under when you just take this teaching to an extreme. I try to get off it, but it just keeps coming up. Sorry. Um, but here he's reigning, and he did that was which was right of the Lord, and he sought God in the days of Hezekiah. He had a good mentor. But I'm telling you, there's going to be a day your mentor is not going to be there. Do you have your roots in Christ where when your mentor's gone, will you still serve God? Will you still seek him? So as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. In verse 7, now we see all of his accomplishments. He had great military. He had great strength. He, he became famous 
All these things happen. And the blessings of God can be dangerous to you if you don't walk in humility. Because pride can destroy the very blessings that humility brought you. People don't teach this. This is how Satan became Satan. Lucifer, the fallen angel, pride was formed in him. God didn't make him proud and haughty. He got impressed with himself, started congratulating himself, wanted to be like the Most High God. And so we just have to say, I don't want anything of the devil living in me. I want what's God, humility, love, working in me, and I have, that's why we have to constantly crucify this flesh while we're on this earth, because our pride wants to resurrect. So we don't want people feeding into that thing God says to crucify. So now here he's getting resurrected. He's starting in verse 8. Uzziah and his name spread abroad even to entering into Egypt, for he strengthened himself. Exceedingly, he started to become famous. The prosperity and the blessings that he got. This is why we're going to go to another scripture in Deuteronomy afterwards. What are you going to do when the blessings do come? I've seen people now that I've been in the ministry over 40 years. As soon as the blessing comes, you know what they do? They forget God. They were humble when they needed him, when they were broke and they were poor. Now all of a sudden they're successful. Now they've learned how to do it. They don't depend on God anymore. This is what happens. He built towers in verse 10. He digged wells, he had much cattle. In verse 11, he had a host of fighting men. He had quite an army. In verse 15, his name spread far abroad, for he was marvelously helped. And underline this, till he was strong. Or you could put, till he got puffed up. Till he got a big head. Till he thought it was all about him. But when he was strong, verse 16, something happened. His heart was lifted up to his own destruction. Be careful when the blessings come. Be careful when the children come you prayed for. Don't put your children ahead of God. Be careful when these things you pray for become an idol. God says anything we place before him that takes his place, a substitute for a relationship with him, becomes an idol. He wants to be first. So his heart was lifted up and what happened to his own destruction. Now what he does next, because he's so successful in all these other areas, he steps over into an office that he was not supposed to step into. He wanted to become a priest. Not only does the main priest come, but also it says many, many, 80 other priests come and they confront him. Boy, when you become narcissistic, and I found this a lot as I've studied this, narcissists, when they become, it's all about them and they come puffed up, you can't correct them. If you try to correct somebody now that's in pride, guess what? You get smeared. You're the bad person. It's all about you. And all of a sudden, instead of now when you are corrected, you don't humble yourself and say, I'm sorry. You get mad and you get angry and you get, here he, he does. These priests come to him and they say, you are stepping in a place you are not supposed to be in. And what does he do? He gets angry. He, he's full of rage. In verse 19, then Uzziah was full of wrath. Wrath. With the priests. And then what happened? Instantly, the leprosy rose up in his forehead. Judgment came. And leprosy is always a type of sin in the Old Testament. It's an outward expression of what's happening. Now all of a sudden, leprosy, and he dies disgraceful. He didn't have to. He started off good seeking the Lord. So I say, it's not how we start. How are we going to finish? How are we going to end? We want to end in humility and total dependence on God, giving God all the praise, all the glory. Amen? Pride, we have to know what pride is because it got the devil. <laughs> and it's getting many people today. Stops listening. When you stop listening to the people around you, oh, they're too small, I, you know. God can use whoever he wants to bring correction to you, even a little child. When you stop listening or I stop listening to correction, we're in trouble. When we st pride stops listening... Uzziah stopped taking advice. And this is one of my favorite things that I've preached on forever. Pride dislikes the role of a learner. 
When we stop being humble, we stop learning. When you're proud, you think you've got your area, your masters, whatever, over this field. It's like nobody can tell me. I know everything to know about that. You're starting to enter into thinking you know more than other people. Pride is self-congratulating. Pride is very narcissistic. And now they are taking narcissism out of health books. It's no longer even mentioned as a problem with mental health anymore. There's so many narcissists today. They are saying there's, it's not an issue anymore. It is an issue. The Bible says we shall be lovers of our own selves. Right. Selfies. Everything's about self. Proverbs 27.2 Let another man praise you and not your own lips. Pride thinks it no longer needs advice. Pride says, I'll do things my way. This is where Uzziah was. I'll do it my way. I don't need to listen to God. I don't need to stay under. I don't need to submit to what God says. After all, look at all my success. And I've heard this before with preachers that have gotten very successful. When you get as successful as I have, then you can tell me what to do. Pride thinks it no longer needs advice. I'll do things my way. It can't be corrected. Why? You can't convince proud people they need anything. They think they have it all. There's no room for God. Proud people have a life that they, the Bible says fools don't even pray. They don't seek God. They think they're so deceived. They're all wrapped up in themselves. They don't realize how bad it is. A couple notes that I pulled out from my file. Pride stops depending on God. The Bible says deny self. Well, what is this self? God can do little with us when self is in control. The part that wants its own way, that justifies itself, wants the spotlight, won't admit it's wrong, gets irritable. Do you know when we get easily offended, we're in pride. It gets offended and mad, critical and judgmental. Or on the opposite side of pride is also fear, shy and being reserved. We can also just, you know, we don't focus on the Lord. We're just focusing on all of our faults. Pride is unteachable. Humility is not pretending we can't do something. Oh, I can't do that. You know you can. That's not humility. That's false humility. Humility is not pretending you can't do something we're trained or gifted to do. It's dependent, and the Bible says, be like a little child. Come back to that simplicity of being childlike and trusting. You resonate to God, giving him his place and the recognition. Just know you're receiving everything from him. Everything we have comes from him. So we just give back to him what he wants. He wants to be praised. He wants our focus. He wants us to give to him. He wants everything. And when you do things, you realize it's everything you do. You live and move and have your being in him. Humility is a loving reverence. It's a loving reverence for him, but it's also a loving reverence for other people. In the Greek word for humility, and I love this, it's taking on the mind of a servant. So we're supposed to humble ourselves amongst each other. We serve each other. Proud people cannot serve. They want to be served. I was thinking this today. When somebody's really got a spirit of pride, even when they walk in the room, all of a sudden, you can see, oh, they're here. Every, everybody caters to this spirit. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like a spirit just entered and we all need, no, we all have to come under this spirit. But humility is not like that. It's, you know, when Jesus would walk in a room, you would, it would just be, I'm sure it would be just a whole different atmosphere. Here, here he's a servant and you want to be like him, you want to serve too. Does that make sense? <clears throat> Another thing from my, my old file I want to read to you. Pride undervalues others. You use them as objects. You don't honor them. The humble can wait patiently while the arrogant want it now. Kind of like your, your show that you guys did that. The patient or the humble can wait patiently while the arrogant want it right now. The humble demonstrates kindness while the arrogant does not even notice the need they don't even know you're hurting. They don't even know you have problems. They don't even care. But a humble person is a servant, so they're always looking. How can I, how can I help? 
The humble are content, not jealous or envious, while the arrogant feel they deserve more. There's a spirit now, an uh, entitlement. I deserve more. The humble honors and esteems the other, while the arrogant brags about himself. Don't you just hate a bragger? The humble act and react correctly, while the arrogant's manners, their manners are rude. You kind of want to say, didn't you ever learn to act right? (laughs) They're rude. The humble show a servant spirit while the arrogant demand to be served. The humble are not touchy while the arrogant are quick to take offense. The humble quickly forgive a suffered wrong while the arrogant can't rest until they even the score. You can see that with narcissists. They don't humble themselves. They have to be right. They have to be one up. It's always about them. Where someone that's humble is, you know what, they're free. You can forgive. Let it go. Proud people can't forget. They always remember, and they always hold something up. So in 1 Corinthians 8, 1, knowledge puffs up. And that's what we got to be careful. The more knowledge we have about something, the more we think we're great on this subject, and we got to tell everybody what we know. It puffs you up. But love, what does it do? It builds up. And let's turn to my last scripture here. Deuteronomy chapter 6. I love this book of Deuteronomy here, especially this chapter. This will keep you on your toes. In verse 10, while you're turning there, impatience is pride. Impatience says, I'm far too important to sit at this red light and wait. (laughs) Ouch. I'm far too important to have to wait. We hate to wait. Becomes rude and angry and quick to take offense. Now, now Deuteronomy, we might as well make adjustments now while we still can. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 10. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he swore unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all things which thou fillest not, and wells dig which thou dig not, vineyards and olive trees which thou planted not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full. Then what do we do? Underline this in your Bible. Therefore, beware. In other words, when things are the best, when things are really going well, when it's just like, oh, I'm so blessed, beware. Lest what? You forget the Lord lest we forget where these blessings came from. Which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Verse 14, You shall not go after other gods, of the gods of the people which are round about you, the spirit of worldliness, the spirit of greed, the spirit of materialism, all these things that we're being fed is part of the kingdom of God. We're not supposed to be following these, these other gods, they're supposed to be following you. If you're blessed, the blessings are supposed to follow us. We're not to seek them and follow them. We're supposed to seek the Lord and trust God. He's going to open the right doors for us. We give God the glory, the praise. We humble ourselves. We stay submitted unto him what he wants us to do. When people hurt you, which they will, don't take offense and get over into proud, anger, wrath, trying to get even. Sometimes you just got to let it go. Cut your losses and just let it go and keep your heart right. The biggest job we're going to have in this life is to keep our heart right. Not let weeds of offense, weeds of bitterness, weeds of regret. All we have is today. Make the most of today, right? Not go after other gods. And then verse 17, diligently keep the commandments of the Lord our God. Beware. Beware. On guard and cautious when success comes. And this is what I think a lot of people need to hear these messages. So now you are successful. Now what? Beware when the consequences of sin no longer bring fear. It's these people that drink and they go drive and they're, they're, they're killing people. They don't, they, they've lost the fear of getting behind the wheel drinking. Maybe, you know, my, uh, when we were, I, there was a 17-year-old that died at our church, 
and it was a friend of my son's, and it so traumatized them. They were drinking and driving, and they died. And to this day, he won't even put it, and he puts his phone on silent. You can't reach him if he's, that so impacted him that his friend died at 17. The consequences of driving and taking even driving for granted, not paying attention, we, we, we just have to beware. When the consequences of sin no longer bring fear, no fear of God's judgment. And this is the problem that we're hearing today is that there's no hell. There's no judgment. Everything's blessed. There's no problems in the world today. It's like trying to put these rose-colored glasses so that the church just falls asleep. No, the Bible says, watch. what are we supposed to be watching and praying for then? What are we supposed to be watching out for? Watch and pray lest you be deceived by the angel of light that's the one world religion that's trying to cause many Christians to join movements. And once you do a study on these movements, the roots of these movements will surprise you. They are not as they appear to be. But unless you study to show yourself approved, you're just going to be totally asleep and thinking, oh, this is fine, and let another man feed you all the time. You've got to learn to feed yourself. And lastly, the humble quickly forgive a suffered wrong while the proud can't rest until they get even with revenge. I deserve to be mad. Well, if you deserve to be mad, you'll also deserve to be poisoned. Bitterness and unforgiveness cause a lot of bad things in our bodies. And God says, for your own good, let it go. Forgive, as even as I have forgiven you, move on. How do you know if you've moved on? You stop talking about it. If you're not through talking about it, you're not over it yet. There's a season you might have to talk about it. There's a season you need to voice it and get it out and maybe vent. But once that season's over, move on. Amen. Amen. Pride keeps you a victim. You run into people, they're always, it's also, no, that, they're in pride. You aren't a victim unless you choose. Yeah, you were abused. Yes, you were, we've all have been in some areas of our life, but we're no longer a victim. That victim mentality keeps you in a spirit of self-pity, which is pride. And you become a bl uh, blamer and you become hard-hearted. Then we become blind and we get this log in our eye. And then we, we end up just focusing on all the things that have happened to us that are so bad. In, in closing, the end times, there's going to be lovers of themselves, narcissists and proud. But remember, God resists the proud. We don't want to be a part of that. And that's why I think the proud won't pray. You know, the publican, he was standing there praying with himself. God wasn't hearing him because he was just talking about how he was self-congratulating how above all these other people he was. God sees that as total pride when he's given us everything. So we have to keep, Father, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. I want to stay in your will. I want to stay connected to the vine. I don't want, you know, and we got to learn to mark those that cause division. And we, the hard part for a lot of us is putting up boundaries and saying, you know what, enough. Enough of this abuse. I'm not taking it anymore. That also is love. You aren't enabling controllers. You aren't enabling narcissistic people to keep abusing you. Jesus didn't. He just moved on. He told the truth and moved on. You want to leave too? We have to be more like Jesus. Amen. Father, we thank you that we want to be dependent on you in these coming days. Lord, we just pray for discernment that we would look beyond the veil. We'd look beyond the veneer. We look beyond the flattery and see the motives of these politicians, salesmen, or preachers, or whatever it might be in our life, friends, family, anybody that's operating in these kind of spirits. In these end times, they shall rise, and you don't want your people deceived. So we give you all the praise and all the glory. And everyone said, Father, Amen. Cleanse me within.